Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technology is the show that puts you, the listener, in the driver's seat because you are the content. The phone lines are open to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAA. That's 1-855-450-6624. Hey, give me a call. We'll have a conversation about your tech questions or business and tech questions. Linux advocate, above all else, small business owner, now host of the only radio show centered around you, the listener. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. My name is Noah Chalaya. Jared starts us off this hour in Florida. Hey, Jared, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. How are you this evening? Excellent. How can we help? Well, I was having a little bit of a uh, vendor problem with trying to find um, a laptop that kind of catered to what I need. Mm, um, welcome to my world. I'm a software developer. Yeah. Uh, I'm a software developer, so uh, something that's really big I need is lots of RAM, uh, like 32 gigs, and of course, like an SSD and hard drive combo. However, I've run into two problems whenever I find a laptop that actually meets those two criteria. Um, one of them is it usually includes something like a graphics card, which is unnecessary for me. I know it's an extra expense add-on I like to avoid. But the other thing is is that the laptops end up getting kind of fat, and I know I can't get, you know, a laptop as thin as paper if I'm trying to get that much RAM and hard drive space, but I really would like to get something that fits all that, and I'm just having a hard time finding uh, vendors that can meet the needs. Not only do you, not only is it an extra expense, Jared, but the other problem with having a built-in dedicated graphics card is that it adds bulk weight to the computer as well as it eats your battery. And, um, and so for those of you who are not familiar, there's two different ways to do a graphics card. You can have a dedicated graphics card that, that is processing the graphics externally, or it can be embedded into the actual chipset of the, of the motherboard. And uh, I have actually had a couple of problems, weird problems, anytime I've tried to use uh, dedicated graphics uh, on laptops. It, not that it doesn't work or not that you can't do it. Um, you know, so for example, uh, Ubuntu has NVIDIA drivers. They have ATI drivers available. Um, but it's just it's one extra hassle, one extra step. And so if you're doing web browsing, checking email, stuff like that, you know you're going to get a lot of a lot more battery, a lot more bang for your buck out of uh, out of disc, out of um, having a in- integrated graphics. Uh, so I completely understand. So I, I was I was trying to jot down as you were talking. So you said you were looking for an SSD. You're looking for graph uh, um, built-in graphics. What were your other requirements? Yeah, well, with the SSD, I also want a uh, hard drive, so you have to have the speed for the operating system, but a good a uh, chunk of memory just for storing things. Mm. Um, 32 gigs RAM, and okay. j- just as lightweight as I could get the thing. Okay. So uh, I'm looking at a couple different options for you. I'll tell you what stands out to me, uh, what stands out to me um, right off the bat, and the only thing I think we're going to run into is a RAM limitation, is the new X1 Carbon. And I don't know if you've seen this, but they have the, I believe it's the 6th gen, or I'm sorry, 7th gen X1 Carbon that came out, and it is a fantastic little computer. It uh, it is razor razor thin. Comes with it, it comes available as a nineteen twenty by ten eighty display, or you can do all the way up to a two K, uh, twenty five sixty by fourteen forty eight both IPS. And I wish Telegram would shut up and people would stop messaging me, uh, when they know that I'm doing a show here. Uh, but yeah, here's the here's the issue. We top out at sixteen gigs of RAM, so thirty two is not going to be an option here. So here are your here's really your option, Jared. You your option is limited to uh, the X1 Carbon, and you can settle for 16 gigs of RAM. Now, do you when you say do you said you're doing development? Do you spin up a lot of VMs? Well, the plan is is to uh, spend a lot more time using Docker, and I mean that that pretty much uses VMs, so that that's why I got the um, the RAM requirement. The reason I ask is because I uh, I have emulated up to uh, 16 workstations. Uh, full-blown Windows workstations on my laptop, and I have 16 gigs of RAM, and I've not run into any problems. So 16 gigs, you can push it further than than you might think. But if you if you're if you're stuck on 32 gigs, then what you'd have to go is you'd have to go there. There are different classes of laptops. So there are there is the obviously the budget entry level. We're going to rule that out. Then there is the what they call the business travel computer. So these are kind of like the the hybrid mix between 
power and functionality and uh, easy easy to um, travel with. Now that's that's where I really like to sit. So my have an X270 really fits that design. It's kind of the ultrabook style, but it still has businessy features, has a lot of battery life, doesn't necessarily have as much power as the next class I'm going to talk about, but it has enough to get all, you know, you can reasonably use it as a desktop replacement. Then you get on to what we call the workstation class laptops. And that's really, if you're looking at 32 gigs of RAM, that's what you're looking at. And a workstation grade laptop is going to have a uh, is going to have you know higher RAM. You're going to actually be able to get a Xeon if that's if you're interested in that. Of course, you can get dedicated graphics if you're interested. Um, and, and 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 so what I'm looking at is there's there's a, I look at Dell and Lenovo primarily for those, and I'm just looking the T series uh, is Dell is uh, excuse me is Lenovo's um, workstation class and it, uh, yeah, it is. And so it looks like the T series is available without dedicated graphics. So that might be an option for you. Uh, it's not telling me what the latest T series is, but you could look it up. Um, and the other option I would look at is the Dell latitude series and the Dell latitude series. And again, I'd have to look to double check, but I believe, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, it is the precision. Uh, the precision series has a higher than uh, than uh, 32 gigs of RAM, or sorry, higher than 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, the the uh, and I, I think I'm running into the, a lot of the same problems you are, Jared. Uh, is that um, you know a lot of these computers, a lot of the people that want 32 gigs of RAM, they're pushing that machine so hard, they're doing something so intensive that they also want dedicated graphics. Um, is it just the expenses, or or are you worried about the other things I talked about, battery life, those kinds of things? I'm sorry, I didn't catch uh, what you said. Are you? Are, is it just the expense that concerns you about dedicated graphics, or are you also worried about battery life and and those kinds of things? Well, it is an expense thing, but it at is. the same time, I, I don't want hardware I'm not going to use. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, so I'm looking. It looks like the T580 is available with greater than 60 you have to add it it looks like you have to add the ram separately but you can get more than 16 gigs of ram into the t580 um but i'll tell you what i'll tell you what so i'm getting conflicting information because i'm looking at uh, i'm looking at crucial site it's telling me i can get up to 30 uh, you can put 32 gigs in ram in a five in a 580 however lenovo site is telling me the max they ship with is 16 gigs and i'd be surprised if the motherboard supported 16 gigs but lenovo wasn't willing to ship it so I, I, I'm running into the same limitations you are, I guess. Uh, I don't have a, I, I don't have a, I don't have a super, a, a super great answer. If you, if you, if you're, if you're set on 32 gigs and you're also set on uh, not having a, uh, a graphics card, I guess the best you could do, Jared, and this is why I was asking, uh, you know, why specifically if it was just a cost thing, because obviously the cost thing you can't avoid, but the only other thing you could do is I guess you could get one with a dedicated graphics and then turn it off. But man, that is really the epitome of, paying for something that you're not going to use. So I'm sorry we don't have a better answer for you. James is calling from Pennsylvania. Hey, James, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. Hey, how can we help? Um, I am uh, kind of outgrowing my current, uh, my main system. I've got um, enough dry, hard drives in there that I'm kind of outgrowing that. And so I wanted to build... Um, build a, a system, I was actually thinking maybe something rack mount that I could have 15 or 20 drives in and then use something like flex raid so I don't actually have to build a whole array at once, but I can add drives individually as I, as I need to. But I was just curious if you had any recommendations for, for hardware for something like that. Yeah, so typically when I go for NAS, I, uh, I I try to stay with either Asus boards or Supermicro. I've had really good luck with both of those, built a lot of free NAS boxes, repurposed a lot of workstation computers that had Supermicro boards or Asus boards in them for free NAS computers and had really great luck doing that too. Uh, as far as, what, what specific hardware recommend? Are you just looking for just kind of general advice or is there a specific hardware thing that you're... Yeah. You have in mind? Or, or a, um, I mean, one of my, one of the, I guess one of my goals is to try and, I'm just thinking about putting um, a 10 gig network card in there. My goal is to try and be, uh, basically to have as close to through, as, as close to throughput if it was an internal drive in my own system as I can. So I was thinking mm. of even like using 10, 10, a 10 gig network card 
And yeah, I didn't. I just didn't know if there's any, like you mentioned, super micro. I assume um, if I would buy a rack mount server from them, something like that, you've had a good enough experience with them that that would be worth pursuing something like that. I didn't know if there's any like model number or anything that you that you would recommend. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you what. I can pull up what we have. We uh, we buy all okay. of our all of our all of our custom built machines. So we we're a Dell partner, and so if we're if it's application specific, like let's say, so we're working with a client, uh, and they are interested in setting up a virtualization environment, right? So for that, we're not going to build a machine. We're just going to buy a Dell server, and they're going to pay for it full price, and we're just going to set it up for them. Uh, so for those things, we go through Dell, but. For any projects things and basically anything we do in-house, uh, we usually put the machines together ourselves or we repurpose older machines. And uh, we're using, I uh, just pulled it up here, Dell Supermicro, uh, it's the model is X11SSM-F-O, and I'll have a link for that in the show notes for you. That's the last one we put together. We put that together, I think, about a year ago. Maybe a little bit more than that. So I'll, th- I'll throw a link for that in the show notes. You can take a look at that motherboard. And then uh, one other thing to check out, if you're looking for some, if you want somebody else to put it together, like you just want the server to show up uh, uh, just, you know, uh, as a server, uh, we use a company called Mr. Rackables. Uh, and he is, he sells a lot on eBay, uh, but you can go to his, I think his website is unixsurplus.com. And we have a rack of his, I call them pizza servers. They're little 1U uh, Atom servers that uh and they're, they're really great for things oh, we actually that's what our free nas is is it's a small little atom board uh, uh you know it's nothing real powerful but it's just you know it's just a couple, most of our guys are remote anyway so it's just oh we have to grab that one file off that thing it's just kind of a place to stash stuff um but we have a whole rack of, of what i call pizza service and we use them for all sorts of little projects and they're 99 bucks so he you know that's his that's wow. his that's his shtick is home of the 99 dollar server and he'll ship you a working one u server for 99 bucks uh but he'll do if you but but yeah, you can email him, and I've done this. So the virtualization server that sits in my house, uh, he built for me, and uh, I just told him, I said, well, I want uh, I want Xeons in it, and I want this much RAM, and I want this much hard drive space, and 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 he'll build it out for you. And um, and the, the the one other thing that I I do, and this is, I guess, a little bit of a tangent, and maybe it doesn't apply to you. Are you putting this in your house by chance? Um, it is actually, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this, this so l- listen up, because this is, I, I think this is something that doesn't get enough attention. Uh, everyone, we all know that racking equipment is a more efficient way to store things than setting it on the shelf, right? But a four post rack, uh, an actual server rack, is expensive. Like you go to Kendall, uh, Kendall, what is it, Kendall Howard or whatever, uh, and 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 you look at the, those four post racks. I mean, most of the stuff we quote is quote out is upwards of a thousand dollars. And so to put a thousand dollar server rack in your house to put a free NAS is kind of ridiculous. And so one of the things that I've done in my house and what I recommend to, to home users or even small offices is they just pick up a two post telco rack and you can buy them off of Amazon for 90 bucks. Um, you know, Amazon prime available again, I'll throw a, a, a link for that in the show notes, but we, I have a 42 U uh, telco uh, 42 U uh, two post telco rack. And the advantage to that is it's way cheaper and you can put a bunch of, uh, of, of rack mount stuff in it. The downside is big KC servers that extend way out the back. You can't, well, most people would tell you you can't mount them. That's not entirely true. You actually can mount them in a two post telco rack. It just takes a little bit of ingenuity and creativity. So there's two things you can do. One is you can buy the pizza box servers. And that's one of the things I like about Mr. Rackables is he will put a Xeon board uh, inside of a 1U case that is only, you know, whatever, I don't know, 16 inches deep or 17 inches deep or whatever it is so that it can be mounted into a two-post telco rack. But the second thing you can do, and again, Mr. Rackables will help you with this, you can buy a rack set that, uh, a rack a set of rack ears, rack uh, uh, rails that mounts in the center of the server. So the server floats uh, in between the two posts of the rack rather than the traditional four post mounting at the front and mounting at the back. And so that's a really cheap way, James, to get uh, to get a rack inside of your house. Okay, cool. What did you say his website was again? Unixsurplus.com. Unixsurplus.com, or you can search uh, Mr. Rackables on eBay, uh, which is, and the thing, here's the, here's the other thing too, just as, a, as an aside, I always find it easier to buy that stuff off of eBay simply because once I have my payment information saved in there, when I need to order another server, I can just log back in and order. Whereas on his website, you're going to have to re-enter the information every single time. And we, I mean, we do it, you know, often. 
to say the least. So I, uh, I, you know, I do it, you know, I, that to me, that just works out better. And he's a great guy. I, I have talked to him a couple of different times. I've made a couple of requests. I had a, a good friend of mine. Uh, we actually had him here on the show. Uh, he had a server for sale and um, my friend emailed him and said, you know, I don't have that much money. Would you take this for it? And he said, yeah, sure. I'll send it to you. So he's a really great guy. He's a fun cool. guy to work with. And, and we've been working with him for years. Uh, and I, I've got a whole rack here at the office. And actually, we're live on KEQQ 88.3 FM in, in Grand Forks. And that whole radio station is powered by Unix Surplus 1U, home of the $99 servers. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yes, sir. Thanks that's for the cool. Yeah, thanks for the call. Again, phone lines one eight five five four five zero Noah. That's one eight five five four five zero six six two four. The email live at asknoahshow dot com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. Now, if you follow tech media, the tech media space, and I assume that if you're listening to this program that you do, then you know that there is a lot of trash out there. The noise level when it comes to podcasts, in particular tech podcasts is insane. And so finding people that can strike this balance between gently pushing you towards a more free open source operating system and bashing the side of your head in like I do and tell you to use Linux, that, that's a difficult line to, 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 to walk. Now, back in 2007, in 2008, somewhere in there, I was looking for a show. I was looking for a host and I wanted this host to have used Mac OS inside and out. I wanted him or her to have used windows inside and out. And I wanted him or her to have used Linux inside and out. And then ultimately I wanted that person to have settled on Linux as their operating system for the desktop because anyone can use Linux on the server and anyone can have an opinion about Linux on the server. And that's, that's nothing special. That doesn't take any talent, but having a passion to advocate for Linux, specifically Linux on the desktop, that's, that's something different. And I knew from my IT experience, I knew from working in the industry, I, I understood the power of open source. I understood the power of Linux. And what I didn't know and what I didn't have was the confidence to actually take that step to wipe windows off my computer and use Linux all day, every day. And I remember I was in a debate with a gentleman on Facebook and we were talking about Linux. We were talking about Fedora specifically, and he cited me uh, a source for what he his standpoint, which I ultimately had to concede to because the source was so accurate and so on point. And that source was a early episode of the Linux Action Show, and it was a uh, episode on uh, 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 of Jupiter Broad uh, on Jupiter Broadcasting. And the question I want to ask you is how many of you can name a media entity that is fully subscribed to open source? How many of you can name an entity that they don't do Windows and they do Mac content and they do tech news content and then as an, as once they got big and they had a bunch of money and then they're like oh there's those little open source guys over there I guess we better uh, throw them a bone every once in a while. How many organizations? How many media entities do you know of that run Linux, run an open source studio, are willing to try Linux at live events? How, how many how many Linux entities do you know of that build interpersonal relationships with all of the major Linux vendors, all of the players, all of the movers and shakers. How many can you name? And, and let me clue you in on a little secret, because if you have some of, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, oh, I never really thought about that. You know, I get people, they'll say, no, how did you build AltaSpeed? I, I want to build something like AltaSpeed, or I want to build the, the equivalent of AltaSpeed in, uh, you know, Ohio or wherever, I don't know. Building a company where you make money off of selling free and open source software is not an easy thing to do. It's a lot of work to be successful to convince somebody to pay you to install or set up what they could get off the internet for free. And we have worked really, really hard to build a, rep uh, you know, a reputation up with our clients. And they trust us. And that trust is what translates into my being able to put dinner on my table. So I protect that trust day and night. And we, when we first started to look at launching the Ask Noah show, 
we had to make a decision if, if anyone, who we were going to partner with. And that was a big discussion. And I took a lot of input from a lot of people. And at the end of the day, I mean, the decision was pretty obvious. It was going to have to be JB or it was going to be nobody because there is literally nobody else in the community that has built up the reputation over the last 10 plus years of providing credible coverage of Linux. And, you know, not just because there's different ways to build up credibility on Linux. Some people will just stomp on the backs of the open source community and they go, well, that's good air content. That's an undercover thing. I'll I'll go make a video about that or I'll go cover that. And they don't they they don't genuinely care and they're not genuinely a part of the community. And Jupiter Broadcasting and, and it, it is one of those companies that is fighting with the community the same struggles that all of you have if you're using Linux. Jupiter Broadcasting and my friend and owner of Jupiter Broadcasting Chris Fisher is fighting those battles alongside of you because that's his brand. And he's not sitting over in some corner, you know, with a tight uh, hat on and, and skinny jeans on a MacBook writing a blog about how Linux looks from the outside. He's spending his own hard-earned money to go to where the Linux community is, regardless if there's profit in it, regardless if there's good content in it. If people ask him to show up to a place to represent or to provide coverage, he does it. And... I have seen the extensive sacrifices he's he has made to make that happen. And he does and he does it because he wants to be a part of the community, because he has a genuine passion for the community and because he has a 10 year track record of crushing his competition doing Linux coverage. And so a couple of weeks ago, I heard that he was revamping a show about Linux, about the community. And we here at the Ask Noah show, I mean, right away, we knew that we had to get him on the air. And that's that's an easy thing to do because he's my boss. <laughs> I feel like I have an in, right? But when the show launched, because I watched this show back uh, during its first run, and the show has relaunched. It's now in the production of its third episode. Two are out and ready to download. You can download those at techtalk.today. But this is bite-sized content that is specifically custom-tailored for the people in 2018. People are busy, and he understands that. And look, I'm proud of what we do here at the Ask Noah Show. I think we have one of the best shows on the internet, but it is tailored for a certain type of audience. And Tech Talk Today is the broad show. It's the show where Chris is going to provide you very concise, very detailed coverage of events. And the show is happening twice a week, so that means that it's happening both at the front of the news cycle and the end of the news cycle. So if you're if you're only subscribed to one show and that show happens to be Tech Talk Today, you never have to worry about missing something. And I have I've been in the truck when I have seen this guy edit. So when I tell you he drills shows down to absolute perfection, I'm not just whistling Dixie. This is this show is so polished. It's one of the most high quality shows I've ever listened to, and that's aside from the fact that it has Linux at its heart. But that's and that's the beautiful thing, because Linux is not just an aside. Even though it's a broad tech coverage show, it's presented by a man who has lived, eaten, breathed Linux all of his life. And he's here to join us on the show so we can talk about the relaunch of Tech Talk today. Hey, Chris. Hey, Noah. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I appreciate it. So tell me what when you were sitting down, you're sitting, you know, you're, you're, you're um, I assume it happened over curry because all good things do. You're sitting down, you're having curry. And, and what was it that drove you to say, you know, the world needs a tech talk today? Well, I, I'll tell you this, but don't tell anybody else this. This is my secret. OK, it's, just between you and me. Like, it's it's the Trojan horse, Noah. It's the Trojan horse. So I'll give you an example of uh, how I feel like tech news can be done better from an open source perspective. This week is garbage for open source news because it's Mobile World Congress. So it's all about the mm. latest smartphones, what Samsung's doing, what all these proprietary vendors are doing. But there is an open source story there. So what Tech Talk today did is we're going to talk about this general tech thing that you probably know about. Mm -hmm. But did you know there's a Red Hat and canonical story to Mobile World Congress? What's Red Hat doing there? Why is Red Hat going to Mobile World Congress? And so in episode 262, I take that track. So here's a general tech story of the week with uh, a little bit of an open source flavor to it. You know, I kind of just sneak it in there, Noah. 
Okay, so I'm 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 a person, and I don't have a lot of time, and I'm I'm picking I'm going through podcasts, and maybe I'm interested in what's going on in the tech world, but I don't really want to hear all the you know the the nitty gritty details, the things that things like TechSnap dig into, and the Ask Noah Show, we dig into that really deep. I just want the cursory overview, or maybe my maybe here's a better question for you. Let me rephrase it a little bit. I have my wife and kids in the car, and we're we're in the car, and and my wife's always saying I don't want to listen to that tech stuff. How does Tech Talk today address those kinds of issues? That is actually a good point. It does. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's pretty selective about what goes in the show. So it's it's stuff that's really going to matter that week. And it's presented in a way of just the highlights you need to know. So there's one upfront story, typically. Format's a little fluid, but it's one one big story up front. And then generally the headlines after that. And that's typically Angela and I uh, bopping those back and forth about at the best clip we can where it doesn't feel too rushed, but it also doesn't drag. And the whole goal is at the end of the 20 minutes, and it's only 20 minutes long, you've got a pretty good idea of what's going on that week. And if you want to queue them up, you stack two of them together, you got a 40-minute podcast. And this is something that, the, the thing that appealed to me, and I, I got this right away on episode one, is when I downloaded it and I started listening to it, it felt like an audiobook. Like, I felt like I was getting drawn into this, I don't want to use the word drama because I feel like it has a bad connotation, but I, I, I got drawn into a story. I got drawn into a world that you set up. And then, and then before I knew it, I'm 15 minutes in and I'm like, I'm learning something. I'm getting news, but it doesn't feel like news. It feels like a 20 minute little audio uh, movie almost. Uh, that I, I thank you. That's a big compliment. I mean, I'm definitely going for a bit of a this, what's the story here, and uh, that's why the launch happened around this time. Is we're going to scale. We're going to scale, and there is a big story to tell about where Linux is going throughout 2018. So I wanted to kind of get this under my belt, so that way when we got there, I kind of had my feet under me and I could produce that. Because I hope we can walk away from this event with a real story to tell about what the next few months and maybe the rest of the year are going to look like for Linux because there's a lot of big projects going there. We can make a lot of connections, and I want to condense that down into a compelling story. So when you – and so, so that brings up – that's a great point. So you're traveling and you're going to all of these different Linux events, and part of it is, you know, people see us there and they say – you know, that's great. I mean, that's that's for some people. Some people really like the, uh, I, I saw them doing their thing, the broadcasting, but you know, it's kind of a pain because I, I couldn't talk to them and I couldn't meet people. And I went to shake, you know, Chris or Noah's hand and, and they had their head down in their laptop. They were sitting behind a microphone. They gave me this crazy look because they had, you know, they were in the middle of a broadcast and I'm trying to have a conversation. And uh, and so this show addresses a lot of that because now the production is, ha you're, you're participating fully inside of the event and the production is happening around it. It's surrounding that environment and it becomes this jack it to to showcase what these things are what is scale what is the experience like yeah i think it means we come away with a better story that's more interesting for the audience to listen to um and you and i essentially get to enjoy ourselves more <laughs> and, and actually have more even more conversations and just attend the conference like attendees and really soak it in instead right. of being at a booth anchored all the time to the booth. So one of the things that I think is, is frustra was frustrating for me as a listener was for a long time, uh, if, if I got if, 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 if when I heard that Chris was going to a conference, one of the things that was very frustrating for me is like, I was like, OK, well, now he's going to have somebody fill in for him or or, you know, maybe the show gets totally canceled or maybe it maybe they pre-record and we get like some sort of an evergreen. But this show addresses a lot of that because you have found creative solutions to evolve the way that you produce this content so you can make it anywhere. That is the goal with Tech Talk today. And all, honestly, a lot of the shows that we've been revamping recently is to do them in a way where if they're not quite there yet, very quickly, they could be in a state where I can be anywhere, the other host can be anywhere, and they stir, they well, at least as best as we can, they still turn out really good, really high quality, because we're just trying to keep the competitive bar there. We're trying to keep these shows competitive with the other podcasts in the market. You know, the Ask Noah show is constantly pushing us to keep staying competitive. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're on my tail now. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about that. I think you got about a ten year lead, but I'm. I'll, I'll no, get there but eventually. you. You. You are my research department. You very yeah. much are. Uh, right. Some of the stuff you're doing on the back end for this show is some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen. Right. It's really neat stuff. Well, it's just, uh, you know, the fact that we're talking, you know, through a piece of technology that, that we, yeah. you know, we started, you know, using for this show. Uh, tell me this. 
so, you know, with the format of the show, one of the things that you said early on was that you were going to keep the, the format of the show loose and flexible. In fact, I think you said it right when you came on here. And that is so interesting to me because one of the it seems like you could you run the risk of getting into a grind of the episode. And sometimes, you know, you start you say, oh, I don't want to listen to that show because it's the grind. But the nice thing about Tech Talk today is you're keeping it loose. So some days there actually might be live events. There might be part, uh, extra participants. Yeah, it's really going to reflect uh, where I'm at at that point in time when I record it. So it is, a, I guess, in a way, it's also a bit of a chronicle of uh, my day when I recorded it. And um, I think that is, not only is that going to be an interesting creative challenge, but I also put a cap on it. So that way I can go full bore for only 10 episodes. It's one season. I'm doing a 10-episode run. I can go crazy, really kill myself making it, knowing that at the end of 10 episodes, I can let off the gas. Yeah, so I guess that's one thing we should have maybe addressed a little bit earlier on. So this is this is a limited run, and and it's running for ten episodes, and then it stops. Now let's say I'm listening to the show, and I'm like, man, this is really good. I mean, this is the show I've been looking for—a concise, well-produced, you know, very high audio quality, uh, very consistent show that is up to date because it's being produced twice a week. So again, I'm I'm at the beginning and the end of the news cycle, and I want it to continue. What can people do to convince you to maybe? To, to take it to stop at 10 episodes and say you know what people really like that I need it to go another 10 like is is it a cost thing is it a is it a, a positive encouragement thing is it a downloads thing I guess if they subscribe uh, you can go to techtalk.today slash subscribe and people start listening I mean I show if this if the show really performs well I tend to move mountains uh, uh, but right now I'm just thinking about it in a 10 episode run I I would you know, if I get closer to the end of that 10 and people are loving it and uh, maybe there'd be like a clear Patreon milestone we could set, I'd probably go for that, but I'd still probably want to take a little downtime. I think that's sort of the fun to it is I don't really know where it's going, but I, I know what I want to do with it as long as it's going. And that is really kind of um, a new take for me. Like, I, oh, it's like a weekly grind for all my shows every single week, whereas this right. is fun. The way I produce it, I, I break it up. I, I use a bunch of different technologies I haven't used before, and I got a limit to it. So I, I really enjoy it. So, you know, obviously we're not going to ask you to spill any of the secret sauce, but I, I, any of those technologies, any of the things that you're doing particularly cool or particularly Linuxy? Well, they're all Linuxy, yeah. Um, okay. And that's what's actually, that's one of the things, I mean, that's actually kind of a, this is kind of the goal I, I had when I wanted to redo some of these shows is it needs to be simple enough for me to do it frequently and it needs to be flexible enough that I can do it under Linux in a way that isn't uh, like me bending over backwards. Like it's just natural. And so I'm just using basic tools. Like uh, I record in Audacity. I encode each side of uh, the host recordings into FLAC. And that's just basic stuff. And then I can, then I can, uh, I, I adjust each person's track. I dial each person's audio in, so everybody has great sounding audio. All that's done on Linux. Wow, that's incredible. That that alone would be a really great. I know you do. Um, I know you're winding down a little bit on the video side, but I, every once in a while you'll do a special episode. That would be really great to see the the, the behind the scenes. Also, chat room. I <laughs> the first couple times I just kind of brushed it off, but it looks like they're they're not giving in. Chat room is saying that uh, they're really happy to see Angela back on a show. So you have done a couple of shows with her. You did the faux show, and uh, she used to host Tech Talk today. So she's back. Is that is that is that is that going to be a permanent thing? Is that just for the first couple? Of episodes, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a common thing. Uh, I okay, don't know if it's gonna sure. be possible, like why I'm in California, but uh, right. because I'll be doing more on the on the move, recording offline as I'm as I'm like recording like news and stuff like that. But when I get back, yeah, it'll probably be a more common thing. She's uh, she's got a whole bunch of stuff that she wants to contribute to the show, so she's been bringing a bunch of really good ideas. So I'd kind of be a fool not to. <laughs> yeah, well, and so and that just that goes again to speak to the. Uh, really the uh, why that show has so much longevity because you're keeping it fast and loose the the ability to be yeah. flexible and say well I'm going to go to I'm going to go to California so I need to be able to record by myself or with whoever's you know maybe Hadia steps in for while you're on the road or whatever or while well, you're down there maybe I can grab you yeah yeah and so and so you you're you're keeping it loose that way and when you're back at the studio and she's available you can swap out and if she's not maybe it would it, is a mumble room is that even a consideration I think specials, that's the other thing I've been thinking of is like special editions, like special Ooh, live shows, special yeah. mumble editions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a Angela adds a good back and forth dynamic to it. Mm -hmm. And she keeps, she's what grounds me back to the general technology because she has really good fundamental questions that I often skip right over. Yeah. And especially when I'm going all Linux or going all open source on sure. something. Like I started in, in, the, in the most recent episode, I started going into Vulkan. And talking about Vulcan, how it's going to be great for Linux gaming. And she helped me keep it grounded and keep it tight. 
Yeah, and she, you know the 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 nice thing is is I think a lot of us a lot of us that are so involved in the tech space I think that we have a tendency to do that because there's a lot of there's a lot of terminology and there's a lot of yeah. technology that we just take for granted and that people yeah. that don't have our background don't have. Well, that's that's uh, that's really cool. I'm really excited to see where that show continues and so people can download the show. Do you recommend they go to the 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 website techtalk.today? Yeah. Yeah, techtalk.today, and you can just plug it into your favorite client, techtalk.today slash RSS, mm. and it'll just uh, start downloading right there. Yeah, and the, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for letting me talk about it. No, it's, I'm really excited about it, because, you know, this really is, I, I hope it reaches out to a new audience and, and gets them thinking about open source issues, too. Well, like you said, you know, and, and it's funny that you that you phrased it this specific way, because we're going to talk about uh, coming up later in the show, uh, an article that came out from Red Hat, um, and, and it's funny that you use the word sneaking uh open source into into people's lives because that's largely what Red Hat says that they have done and what their logo represents and so we're going to talk about that just coming up in a couple of minutes but uh but but what what the show has the ability to do I think is reach a broader audience than you ever have before and it, like I said if anyone listens to it, all you have to do is listen to the first 5 minutes and you're hooked because it's it's such a compelling show and it's so short that it 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 gets over and you're like wait that's it it's over and and so it, it it's it's a very easy it's very easy to consume i guess so thanks a lot for coming on the program to talk about it and oh, i i should mention too tech talk dot uh today the website is absolutely fantastic so you have all of these resources right on the uh, on the website and you've done this with a couple of your shows now where a lot of people say, well, I watched the show on YouTube, but, you know, the show notes aren't there or the links that you talked about weren't there. That's all solved with this website. I mean, you're doing it all right on here. I can listen. I can listen live to the uh, the uh, the show. I can download these episodes and then you have all of the links right here, too. Yep. Yep. For subscriptions. And I'm putting all that stuff in the notes when you get it on the podcast catcher, as well as chapter markers in the podcast itself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Now, I just, there's just one, one last question I have to ask, Chris. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know what the next holiday is. I suppose Christmas is coming up, but if I were to, uh, if I were to get you a, a, a decent pair of sandals or shoes, like, would you <laughs> no, consider redoing no. a logo? You know, maybe, you know, I, if I, we could Photoshop or GIMP or whatever you want to call it, some uh, sandals on there, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, that would probably be pretty good. Yeah, I feel like it's, an, it's, a memorable th it's a memorable thing. I was, I, I don't know what's going on with those feet. You got to go know. check it out. Tech Talk Doc today, I, you should check it out. The truth is, I would have never noticed it. It's just, it seems to be what everyone else wants to give you crap about. So I was yeah, like, well, might as well mm -hmm. bring it up. You, you know what? I leave it to the audience. They can be the judge if we should GIMP some sandals onto my feet. All right. Tech Talk dot today, the new show episode. I assume one will be coming out at the end of this week. Yeah, that's the plan. Of course, I'll be packing up for scale, but I'm going to try to get one out on the way out to scale. Okay. So Tech Talk dot today, two episodes out. The first, I haven't listened to the second one yet. First one was absolutely incredible. And of oh, course, you're in it. Oh, am I? I'm in the second yeah, a little one? bit. Mm -hmm. You are. You should listen to it. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then, of course, the entire back catalog is there. So if you want to check out what the show was, it, it, can, it can never hurt. And uh, Chris Fisher, check it out, jupiterbroadcasting.com. They can follow you on, on Twitter, at Chris LAS. They can follow the network, at Jupiter Signal. Does, uh, is, I, I assume this doesn't have a specific Twitter handle. No, no. At Jupiter Signal is what we're using for it. Okay, awesome. And then, Thank if you, they, and then if they want to, if they want to, if they're if they're if they're really appreciating the content and they want to support you financially, because you know when you start a show like this, you're funding it out of your pocket. Like you're just hoping that it takes off and that it gains some feet, and maybe then it starts bringing some money. But at, at, you know, when you start out, you're like the pocket recorders and the microphones that you're going to have to have to do these interviews. All that's coming out of your pocket. So if they want to donate, that I assume Patreon. Yeah, patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal. And I do plan during the 10-episode run, especially, I would imagine, towards the end of the season, releasing exclusive content, maybe some interviews, things Ooh. like that. Patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal. Yeah, hey, thanks, by the way, for my uh, Jupiter Broadcasting Notebook. It now sits uh, by my side as I do my, uh, my Ask No Show. It's my, it's my episode ideas book. Yeah, I liked your selfie with it. That was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, it showed up in the mail as random. That's, that's, the, that's a real advantage to being part of the Swag Club is you get, yeah, uh, you get crazy cool things. Yeah, we don't talk about yep. it enough. Hey, yeah. thanks for joining the program. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. It's been fun. Awesome. We'll catch you later. Uh, phone lines are open. 1-855-450-NOAA. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. So we have talked a little bit about password managers on this show, and I have a love-hate relationship with password managers for a couple of reasons. I don't like cloud-hosted things. But at the same time, I also don't like having to try to remember passwords. 
I also don't like having insecure accounts. So I, the, a password manager has always been a necessary evil. Now, I started back in the day with LastPass. Well, I started with the built-in password manager of the, the, uh, of the uh, you know, web browser, uh, Firefox. And uh, then eventually I went to LastPass. And uh, lately, I've been using KeePass X. Now, a lot of you know that I am a C file user, and uh, actually, I have actually you know, that's something we could have talked to Chris about while we had him. But uh, C file is has changed my life, and we did a whole episode on C file. It's like episode three or four. If you go back and look, it's called uh, having a backup plan. But check it out. We talk about what C file is and how great it is, how to set it up, how it'll change your life. But what C file does fundamentally is make my files available everywhere. And so it makes other applications more useful like KeePass X. So because cfile has a mobile client, because cfile runs locally on my laptop, it means that my KeePass uh, database is automatic, automatically synced over all of my devices. And I have access to it as if it was just like LastPass. And of course there's browser plugins. So it literally functions almost identical to LastPass, except it's open source. It's hosted locally. I don't have to worry about somebody taking the information. And it was actually funny. I was just a, just a week ago, two weeks ago, we were talking. I was talking to one of the guys that works for me. And uh, and I was saying, you know, we should really set up a shared key pass uh, database for our Ulta speed passwords, various different things. And he's like, yeah, I don't really know. I've never really played with it. We should check it out. He's an open source guy. And so we uh, we uh, we put it on the company C file server and shared it back and forth. And he's like, yeah, this is amazing. So that has been option, like a great option for a long, long time. And a couple of months ago, I switched over to a hardware password manager called the Multipass, M-O-O-L-T-I-P-A-S-S. -S. And if you're not familiar with what the Multipass is, um, the Multipass is a physical device that stores the passwords on, on, the, on this physical device, and they are encrypted with a smart card. And you can duplicate the smart card credentials so you can keep like one in a safety deposit box and one on your person or whatever. And uh, you plug this device into your computer or smartphone or whatever else, and it will talk to the browser or the application that you're using to enter the password. Now, here's where MultiPass sets itself apart from other password managers. MultiPass will allow you to emulate a keyboard. So, for example, let's say you know what you're doing, and so you rent your service from DigitalOcean, and maybe you even used a, a, a code like Dio Unplugged to get you know some money off that server. If you buy, if you go to access the console console of that server, it runs in like this little, I don't know, Java web thing, uh, which is the 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 text input of which is not talking to the browser. So the browser has no idea what is inside of that little Java object, and so. Traditional password managers won't work on on that thing. So if you have a you know 32 character root password that has all of these characters and stuff, you got to physically type all that out. Uh, oftentimes, even copy and paste won't work. It depends on the it depends on the VPS provider. Uh, the nice thing about MultiPass is it actually emulates a keyboard. So I can push a button and it turns into keyboard emulation mode. I choose the password I want and it will actually type that password out. And that's and so for me, the multipass has always been the best option. The downside to multipass is it is a physical hardware device. It also, again, it's encrypted with smart cards, so that means that you actually have to have one of those smart cards available to you. And so that can be a, a bit of a downer. Well, this week, uh, a, a listener of the show sent me a link to try out a password manager called Bitwarden. Now, Bitwarden is 100% open source. And they say on their site that the source code for Bitwarden is hosted on GitHub and everyone is free to review, audit, and contribute to the Bitwarden code base. We believe that open source is one of the most important features of Bitwarden. Source code is transparent and an absolute requirement for solutions to Bitwarden. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm sold. At least, you know, not necessarily I'm switching over to it, but hey, you know what? It's an open source thing. And so even though it's a service, not I would like it to see it self-hosted, even though it's a service, that's pretty good. Oh, but wait. It is or it can be self-hosted. So for there are certain people that I've talked to and they've said, listen, I am all about the, the self-hosting thing. That's all great and well. And I'm glad that you want an IT company with a rack full of Atom servers from Unix surplus that you can just willy nilly decide I need a new server for this. And then you have a new server. The rest of society doesn't live like that. And so every if, if I need a server, I'm going to have to fight with the stupid thing for three hours because I don't set servers up for a living. And so if I'm going to use something, I just have to be able to, even if it costs me some money, I just need to be able to sit down, sign up for the service and use it. 
Well, guess what? Bitwarden has you covered because Bitwarden allows you to self-host. In fact, they encourage you to self-host and they do it with a Docker container. So it is, I watched a, I watched a, a YouTube video. They have on their YouTube channel, you can go to search Bitwarden on YouTube and they have a how-to, how to set it up. And I, I was actually, I was planning a how-to. I'm like, oh, this is really great. I should show people how to do it. And I'm like, show people how to execute like four commands. And not only that, they have a video. It's actually, it's fairly well done that shows you how to set up your own hosted Bitwarden service. So self-hosted automatically syncs between all your devices. They have an Android app and an iOS app. So they have um, Bitwarden iOS vault and Bitwarden, they call it Android vault. Uh, it also is compatible with the YubiKey. So if you're not familiar with the YubiKey, it is a hardware-based authentication device. Now that is what they call a premium service. But it works with YubiKey, so you can have two-factor authentication, and it's hardware-based, encrypted two-factor authentication that never gives up the private key. Uh, I, I don't. There is. I, I don't really see a downside to this. Uh, there is something to be said again about the physical keyboard emulation and the fact that all of my passwords are locally stored on a physical device that I can, you know, completely destroy if I want to, uh, or, you know, whatever. It's that, that there is something to that, and I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not sold 100% on the service thing, but man, so, something like this, this definitely is a better choice than KeyPass X combined with uh, C file, because that, that's essentially what I'm doing. I am ho self hosting my ability to sh share my passwords around and then using a client that incorporates them. So I have given Bitwarden a, uh, a whirl uh, this week. What I'm a little bit worried about, and uh, this is where open source is going to save the day. I, I with LastPass, it was a great concept. It was great design. And then what happened was we got hosed. We they 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 sold out on us, and uh, and that was really frustrating. Um, what's nice about Bitwarden is that can't happen this time, and it can't happen this time because if just let's just say at some point somebody comes in and says, okay, well we're gonna go ahead and buy. Uh, you know, bit worn out and we're going to go ahead and put our own thing in. That's, you know, so be it. But what's going to happen is you can go back and take the source code and compile it yourself and somebody can continue on with the project uh, or they can fork it. So I think that's, I, I, I just think it's a really great project. And I think that it, uh, it it's, it's going to be the, the next de facto standard for password manager, because I think it has everything that LastPass had and has a little bit more. Again, open phones this hour, 1-855-450-NOAA. That's 1-855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Now, Chris uh, used the phrase sneaking open source uh, into people's lives. Headline, redhat.com. Help us make our mark. The Open Brand Project is an open initiative to update and simplify our corporate logo and brand system. It's not a contest. It's a collaboration. We need your ideas and comments. The more feedback we get, the more likely we are to make the best decision and see unforeseen problems. So let's stop right there and talk about the way they just open that up. If you read Jim Whitehurst's book, and I have, the entire premise of the book is how he was formerly the CEO of Delta Airlines, and he was going to march in and show this Red Hat company how they don't know how to run a company. A company should be run from the top down. It's people at the bottom, this open source idea, people suggesting things all willy-nilly. That's not the way you do a company. And it changed him, fundamentally changed him from the inside out. We need your ideas and comments. The more feedback we get, the more likely we are to make the best decision and unforeseen problems. Coming up in an episode in the Ask Noah show very soon, we haven't quite nailed down exactly when we're going to do this. We're going to tell the story of Speed, the detailed story of how we got started. And uh, part of that story is going to include how we came up with our logo. But let me tell you, I wish I had the insight to, <laughs> to get feedback. So we made the best decision and avoided unforeseen problems. So th this website, uh, and we'll have it linked in the show notes, goes on to talk about 17 years of a logo is a long time. The last time we updated our logo was in 2000. Back then, we were upstarts changing the gates of the closed monolistic, mono, monopolistic technology industry. We knew that open collaboration was the best way to create better software, but we had a lot to prove. Part of the superhero, part superhero, part private detective, our logo reflected our origin story, especially our early market strategy, bringing open source into data centers and sneaking past the barriers built by proprietary technology. 
Today, Red Hat is the world's leader of enterprise open source solutions. Open source is ubiquitous and trusted in the world's most demanding data centers. Our logo made a lot of sense when we were secret agents of change, but our brand that promises openness, transparency, and sharing, it sends the wrong message. Our next brand needs to identify and resonate with who we are now while still honoring our revolutionary roots. Man, if I, I tell you what, if there is if there is not a time to get like if the hair on the back of your neck didn't stand up when I was reading that, uh, you're doing it wrong. I, I just this is so cool, and I, I I know that we're talking about a story about a logo here, but I think the bigger picture here is the way that Red Hat as a company operates, the way that Red Hat as a company treats its employees, treats its projects, treats the the way it it they approach things like even the logo thing itself, like it's the way that they're approaching it. I think that is so impressive to me. So, uh, you know, if you have an idea of how you can contribute to the, uh, the red hat logo, uh, give it a shot. And again, like I said, we'll have a link in the show notes, but I, I think that's pretty cool. Again, open phone lines, one 450 Noah. That's one 450 The email Live at AskNoahShow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. Our Distro Elimination Challenge got a little bit forgotten about last week. I'm so sorry, guys. We asked you which of the two distros you would pick. Would you pick Antargos or Manjaro? And uh, again, I have been wrong almost every single time I tried uh, uh, to predict what what people were going to do. Now, some of that was is a little bit, you know, eh, there's some there's some hinky stuff going on because... What happened was uh, various people shared, uh, you know, on their Twitter for one specific thing and, and not the other. And so that that led people to, you know, to to, to lean one way or the other. But uh, we are excited to announce that the winner was Manjaro with 58.87% of the votes as opposed to Antargos with only 41% of the votes. So Manjaro continues on and Antargos does not. And uh, I tell you what, after we get done with this Linux Elimination Challenge, I would love to hear what your rationale was for this. Um, we are winding down the Distro Elimination Challenge. We've only got a couple of uh, a couple of the ones left, and then we enter into round two. Uh, the Yeah, and, and the chat room is calling it out. They're saying low participation. But you know what, uh, JJ, I, I would say that too, except if you look, 136 votes for Manjaro and uh, 95 votes for Antargos. So it, you can't, I mean, man, that's, you know, that's over 200 people that cast their votes. I mean, that's that's representative of something. So I I don't know I don't know and then if you look at uh, when we did uh, do, 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 uh, Pop OS versus uh, Ubuntu Mate, I think it was uh, Ubuntu uh, you know Pop OS was like way and above the amount of I would have thought even above the amount of users that were actively using Pop OS and they you know they they came out in in droves to vote so I I'm not sure if it's low turnout I think there's actually a lot of people voicing their opinions and I think that that's one of the things that originally set us out to start the distro elimination challenge is. I think there's a lot of preconceived notions and I and I wonder if they're just continually perpetuated and nobody ever takes the time to ask the question, which distro would you prefer? And of course, there's never going to be a perfect distro for any one person. And that's why we need to build the Amazon review sites of Linux distros where you can write a review and say, I chose this Linux distro because of these features or because of these things. And somebody else can come and say, okay, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Ubuntu, Pro I'm just making it up. Ubuntu proper is the most uh, popular distro on the entire, uh, distro elimination challenge site. And so, uh, why is it the most popular? Well, it has the most software availability and it is, it's widely regarded as the most stable and it's backed by a company that really cares about desktop Linux and it runs snaps and it, you know, here are the things. And then you start looking at it and you say, well, really, I am moving out into the woods and I'm putting on a tinfoil hat and I don't really care about any of that because it's not going to be connected to the computer. I just want the most secure version of Linux I can get. Well, that's a very different use case. And so what a website that is going to catalog and categorize and review and provide outcomes of all of these distros, then you need to have a website that says, here's the distro you pick if all you care about is security. And so that's what we're setting out to do. And that starts with just kind of getting a, just kind of getting a, uh, you know, a, an overview of the land, so to speak, which distros are out there, which people are choosing which ones and why, 
uh, and and so that's what we're collecting right now. And so we're trying to it's it's kind of a game thing. You know, it's a little clickbaity, you know, go and vote for your favorite distro, that kind of thing. It gets people out. But we, we're taking opinions. And and so what we're doing is we're fine. We're weeding out, you know, where do we concentrate the most effort? There's so I'll, I'll, you know, just uh, just to, to, just because why not pick on one of these uh, one of these people? So um, uh, Guix, G U I X S D. I've never used that particular distro. It did not win the distro elimination challenge when it was paired against uh, Solus, I think against uh no solid x uh and so we're not going to spend a lot of time building a page for people to write reviews and vote on uh, gui xsd to begin with we're going to start with the more popular ones and we need to know what distros are out there people uh, what uh, which distros people are using and if there's anything the distro elimination challenge has taught me is that the distros that are that people prefer the distros that are out there are not what is commonly being touted and so that's an that's an issue that we at the ask Noah show want to address so asknoshow.com slash elimination this week it is magic wheel says nixos versus maui linux nixos versus maui linux so check those out asknoshow.com slash elimination make your voice heard I, I want to know which of those two distros you would use now there's been some confusion and people have written into the program and I've tried to address it as best I can, but I'll make a point to talk about it on air here. When we say go vote for one of these particular distributions, it, it, I am not asking you which distribution are you wiping your computer off to, to use. So there should be, cause there are people out there that have told me they're like, well, I'm going to vote. I just, you haven't come across my distro yet. That doesn't work like that. Like, it, I'm just asking if you were stuck on an island and your choices were NixOS or Maui Linux and you had to choose one of those distros to install so that you can activate your GSM ting that Noah gave you and send a call for help. If if that's what you're going to do, which of those which of those flash drives are you picking up? Are you picking up the NixOS disk or are you picking up the Maui Linux disk? And then cast your vote. So everyone should be able to vote and should be voting every single week. Because I would imagine if you're on an island and you wanted to get home, you'd pick one of those two distros. So which one of those two would you try? And you know what's interesting is once we get done, and I'm going to go from the most popular to the, to the least popular, but I am really excited to actually take a look and play with some of these distros because I've not had a chance to do so. Also, I wanted to make an announcement too. If, you, if anyone knows anyone that works for the BBC... British Broadcasting, particularly the radio division, I want to talk to somebody in BBC. I have tried everything I can think of up to and including um, aggressively tweeting people uh, over at the BBC. And if I had gotten an answer, if they were like, no, we don't want to talk to you, then I I would just shut up. But I haven't gotten an answer. And so I, I, I don't know if it's just they don't want to talk or about about something really cool that they're doing or if it's just the noise level on Twitter is very high. But the BBC is doing something that I think is really cool and I want to bring some attention to on the Ask Noah show. They are, uh, they are, they are basically, they have, they went to do, redo all of their radio stations. And what they found was it was going to be very expensive to rehab every single radio station uh, over across the pond. And so they started looking at creative ways that they could do that. And what they found was they could leverage Linux and the internet and modern ways of moving audio across the internet so that you can have a microphone and you can have a control surface uh, in a given studio, but you put all of the mixers and you put all of the processing and you put all of the phones and you put all of the technicians and all of that stuff in one central place. And so instead of building like five, $10 million studios, you build five, $1 million studios and then build one really big, like $3 million facility that, ha that houses all of this central stuff. And so the project is called Vilor, V I L O R and it's virtual local radio. So all of the radio hosts, are local they're not they're not because one of the ways that other people do this is they just they syndicate they just they have a central thing and they make all the content and then they send it out to a bunch of radio stations that's not what's happening here all of these guys are local talent they're all existing inside of their own individual communities creating local radio it just it exists on this really big Vilor network. And I want to bring somebody on the program and talk about it. And I've been trying for weeks to get a hold of somebody and not having a little luck. So I'm hoping I can ping the, uh, the ask Noah show community and somebody, I know there's people over there across the, 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 the pond, somebody go knock on their door and say, Hey, 
hey, you guys are doing cool things with Linux and no one wants to talk to you. And uh, from what I can tell, the people that have set this stuff up, all being done on Linux, they are true geeks. They're geeks at the heart. Hey guys, did you know you can download this show, podcast.asknoahshow.com? Make sure to check it out. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. A huge thanks to Vox Telsis for providing our phone systems, Ben, our producer, sir, our call screener, Rakai, our video editor. We'll hand you off to the harm reduction report coming up on the all-new independent talk, KEQQ 88.3.